I'm not going to preach on the gospel today, but that one line just caught my ear. Jesus says to the disciples, do you understand all this? And they say, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry. I have been thinking about this um, sermon for a while because um, Romans 8, the best chapter in the whole Bible, the best. And, and uh, our reader did such a good job of pulling out the, the drama in that, in that text. So you're going to hear me talk about Romans a little bit today. So this is the end of that, that chapter. Now there's another, I think, eight chapters in Romans. And he says good stuff there as well. But really, really, this is it. Now so far in the letter, Paul has been building a case for the gospel to a community that he has not met. He has not yet been to Rome. Uh, I, I think I mentioned last week, um, there are some biblical scholars that, that think that maybe Phoebe, who's named at the end of the letter, was the one who brought the letter to Rome, who might have been the one reading the letter to the little church house communities. So imagine um, this text being read in a woman's voice um, to these communities. It's a theory, but I like it. And so in the letter, he has been talking about what went wrong with us mortals and how God has chosen to respond. Now, for the last two weeks, we've been hearing um, the first two sections of chapter eight, signaling that he has laid the groundwork to draw a conclusion. He begins the chapter with a thesis statement that any English teacher would love. The, the chapter begins with this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have been set free, he says, from the law of sin and death. And for him, sin and death are, are not just their literal concepts, but they're sort of cosmic personalities, cosmic forces that are beyond our control. And so Paul talks at length about the connection between the flesh and death. Now, it's important to know that when Paul talks about flesh, he uses the word sarx, from which we would get the word sarcophagus. And he's referring not simply to a literal body, but to the body that's caught up in the ways of the world, um, that which we might call carnal. I know that's Latin, but y'all know what I mean. The point is that but we, his main point here is that we've been given freedom. He says a little later, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. In Christ, we are no longer enslaved, not by the flesh, not by the law. And as he notes here, we are not enslaved by fear. Fear no longer owns us. And what is the consequence of that freedom from fear? He says it is intimacy with God. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, it's important to give this background to today's text because Paul is writing not just to the Romans, but to us. And so I really want you to get what he's trying to say in the verses we heard today. Paul wants us to know that the gospel is not some transactional way to stay out of hell. Um, he probably would have been mystified by the ways that many Christians talk about the gospel today. He wants us to know that for us, there is no condemnation. That we, not just the folks in the various house churches in Rome, but we too are freed, freed from sin and death, freed from the law and freed from fear. Fear no longer is in control. And now we get to what we heard last week, those powerful poignant words that remind us that it is not only our salvation that is at stake, Oh, this is such good stuff. He said, last week we heard, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to, to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, 
the redemption of our bodies. All of creation is watching and waiting, Paul says, holding its breath, groaning in labor pains. For those of you who've been in labor know what that's like. For our redemption, the creation is waiting for us to be redeemed. And boy, does that ring true in the hottest year in human history, all of history. Creation hopes that it will obtain, and here's the key phrase, the freedom of the glory of the children of God. That's us. Freed, glorious children of God. Do you feel free right now? Do you feel glorious? Do you feel like you're a child of God? Some of us might say yes to any or all of those things enthusiastically and joyously. Some of us may feel like sinking down in our seats because we are convinced that everyone knows that we are enslaved to our past, to our failings, to our fears, and definitely not glorious, and that probably God hates us. And many of us are somewhere in between depending on the day. So Paul gives us a nudge. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Even if we don't see our God-given glory, hope promises us that it's there. So now we get to today's passage where Paul brings it all home. Oh, and how he brings it home. What does he say next? Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Now, since the reading today starts in the middle of a logical argument, we didn't read the word likewise this morning, but that's how Paul starts. Likewise. That is, He's connecting it to what came before. Just as the Spirit accompanies the laboring creation and just as the Spirit gives hope, likewise, the Spirit helps us to pray. Not only helps us to pray, but prays through us in expressing what we know, what we long to express, but human finitude can't quite articulate. Paul, throughout this whole letter, has been setting us up. We are sinful and we are saved. We are free and we are bound. We are glorious now, but also kind of not yet. How do we live like that? How do we live in that in-between place? And so now, Paul takes a deep rhetorical breath and does what Paul does best. This is what I love about Paul, when he gets excited. And he gets so excited that all the words come tumbling out and you wait, wondering if he's going to pass out before he gets it all said. Like, if you were to go and parse some of those sentences, like, it's phrase on phrase. So let's walk through it. We know all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. A measured start. Seems reasonable. But then, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, this is where people get tripped up, especially those of you um, who may have a Calvinist background because the Calvinists really like talking about predestination. But it's simple, I think. Whom did God foreknow? All of us. Everyone. Everyone here this morning, everyone in every church, everyone in every temple, every mosque and synagogue, everyone in every restaurant having brunch, everyone in every war zone, Southside Chicago, Ukraine, Sudan, therefore all those whom God foreknew, that is all of us, have been predestined. God has always had a vision for us, a dream of who we can be. But what is it? He follows, and those whom he predestined, he also called. Predestination isn't compulsory. God is calling us, God is inviting us, and we are free to answer. And those whom he called, he also justified. Now, this is a classic Pauline word, and it means to be declared righteous, but also could have a little bit of a sense of being able to do justice. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And there it is, that glory word again, the glory that creation awaits, the glory that is about being free. What then are we to say about these things, Paul says? 
If God is for us, who is against us? I could end here, but I'm not. What more do we need to know? For those of you who may have any doubt that God desires you to be free and glorified, I want you to hear these words. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for you, who can be against you? The trick is that this applies not just to you, but to me, and to that neighbor down the street with the objectionable political sign, and that person who betrayed you and broke your heart, and that one person at work who irritates you beyond your last nerve. God is for them as well. Now, I'm not going to be able to go through all of the verses because this is an Episcopal church, not a Presbyterian church, and you would revolt if I preached for half an hour. Um, but go home and read these verses again and again. I want to jump to the verses at the very end of this chapter. The verses that I uh, turn to when I don't know why I bother with anything. The verses that my family knows will be read at my funeral. The verses that we should all know by heart. This is what I cling to. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Who indeed? No one will separate us, and no thing will separate us from the love of Christ. This is the glorious mystery. Paul says that no circumstance will separate us from the love of Christ. Now, some may read this to mean that we have to maintain a sort of false cheerfulness and stoicism or certainty in the, time, in the face of horrible circumstances. But that goes against everything that Paul has tried to tell us and that he says in this chapter. Staying in Christ's love does not depend on us. We are loved, no matter what the circumstances, and this is crucial, no matter how we respond. Yes, a strong faith and a resilient hope can make things easy for us, easier for us. But even if we doubt or fall or fail, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. No, he continues, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And here Paul throws in something that blows my mind. In all of these things, all of the things that he's listed, struggles and obstacles and horrors, we are, and then he uses this word, we are something. He uses a word that is used once in all of scripture. It's a verb, and I can't pronounce Greek, but I think it's hooper nikau, which if you take it apart, you have hooper, H-Y-P-E-R, like hyper, which means beyond or exceeding or more than, and nikau, which means to conquer. What does this made up word mean? On one level, it could be that Paul is simply saying that no power can overcome us, that we will conquer all conquerors. And that's true. And I think he's saying something even more revolutionary. What if we are not just more than but beyond conquerors. That is, what if none of those things that we judge powerful, what if none of those things that we fear ultimately has control? Paul has said there is no condemnation and that we did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear and that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us and that the very spirit of God breathes in and through us. The powers of the world no longer have power over us. We have gotten a glimpse of the glory that God has dreamt for us, foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified, and this lies within us already, waiting to be fully revealed. We have gone beyond the world's understanding of victory. Now in all this glory, 
Paul reminds us that he knew suffering. He's not saying that we will not suffer, nor that our lives will somehow be all sunshine no matter what happens. He grieved, and so do we. He was frustrated, and so are we. He was sometimes wrong, and so are we. What he's saying is that there is a deeper reality than the powers and principalities that try to destroy the children of God. We have been promised the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And even if we look downtrodden or discouraged or dismayed, the ultimate truth, the truth for all of you, is that we are free because it doesn't depend on us. God took the first step and will not let us go. And here's the close. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you hear that? Nothing. Now, of course, we all have our part. God gives us agency, and we are invited to work with God in the redemption of the world. But here in this chapter, Paul is telling the Roman church, small and beleaguered, and us in our own times of fear and suffering, that there there is nothing that will get in the way of God's dreams for us. And that, my siblings, is glorious freedom indeed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.